Good evening uh, for Bible School. This evening we continue in the book of Romans. Why do we teach the book of Romans? Because the book of Romans beautifully explains many things uh, concerning the way of salvation, justification, uh, and many, many other uh, aspects of the Christian life. And basically we can, we can say that uh, it's not difficult to understand it. Because some people are afraid of the book of Romans. Some people say it's too difficult to, to read it. And uh, I have to disagree. The book of Romans is beautifully written. written. It goes verse by verse. There is a fault line which prepares the stage for the entry and then the truth is beautifully revealed. It's, it's an amazing book and it's not difficult. And of course there are things we may be puzzled for the beginning, how to see it, how to understand it. But as we study and we go and we get the fault line from the book of Romans chapter 1 and so on, and we see the truth being unfolded, you know, and built up, we see the beautiful message delivered to us. So through the prayer and leading of the Holy Spirit, it's not a uh, problem at all for us to, to understand it. Uh, we rejoice in it. And today we continue. Uh, this is a class number 32, and let's, uh, let's, uh, let's pray and continue. So dear God, we just, we just ask you to, to speak to us. Thank you for the light you give us on these verses, that we have your understanding. Thank you for the scripture which has been preserved through the ages. We have a book we can trust, you know, historically proven, uh, we can trust this book. The most amazing book in the world. Wow, what a beauty. And we have it, you know. Let's just realize that there are some places in the world today that you cannot possess uh, this book uh, and not to be in danger of life. But here we can, we can study the book openly, we can preach this book. Uh, basically openly uh, so there are like no no uh, no problems so far so we just thank you for this God just keep this uh, freedom of studying and preaching this book uh, being uh, being a salt and light to the world thank you God that we are in the Balkans where we can do it joyfully protect us and bless this hour as we study and ponder on your word because it's a lamp unto our feet, it's a life to us. Bless these words in Jesus' name we pray. Lead us, speak to us. Make our heart soft and full of understanding uh, of, of your, of your uh, expressions. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we continue, and if you would turn with me into the book of Romans, Chapter 8. We finished with these verses last time, uh, verse 14 to 17, and now we continue. Let's just, let's just read it. So as many as are under the new government of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And uh, for you have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We spoke about this. It's beautiful. We are under the new government of the Holy Spirit, verse 14. We are therefore called the sons of God and we are part of God's family. Verse 15, we don't have the spirit of bondage, of the chains, of, of the... Of, of the uh, of the sentence of condemnation and being bound by the law and rules, but we are not under the fear of doing something uh, with the, with the uh, sentence of death, which we said, 
because the law brings the fruit unto death, the children of death. But we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We are a part of, of God's family. This is so beautiful. You know, the God, the creator of the universe is our Father. Well, it's so significant. What does it mean to us? It means like you can run to him. You can run to, into his presence in a time of need to the throne of grace and you just come and you say, Abba, Father. You know, the simplest words. And we are accepted based on the work of Jesus Christ that we read in the previous passages. And now it says, and the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We have this assurance. You know, there is this beautiful song, uh, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I cannot sing, so don't laugh, please. But I just wanted to, <laughs> wanted to make the tune for you that you would, uh, you would remember. And that's, that's the point. Uh, do we understand that all this God's work, which is touching so many areas of our life, uh, based on the law, on the adoption, on being a new person in Christ, and many other things, do we understand we have this assurance, we have this witness of the Holy Spirit? Do we have this witness? You know, and of course, uh, if we do not understand the book of Romans, if we do not study the scriptures, if we, if we uh, take some uh, passage from the Old Testament and we try to apply it on us, not understanding the uh, divisions, the ions, the, the ages, uh, or, uh, or how God deals differently with the different uh, people groups, uh, the dispensations, then, then we may be confused. Uh, somebody can say uh, the story of, of, of the virgins not having the oil in the lamps, you know. Maybe you are the virgin which doesn't have the oil in the lamp and you will be like cast out and, and, and you see you cannot be sure of your salvation. Well, uh, that's not the true explanation of those passages, you know. The virgins, and we spoke about it already a few times, it speaks about Israel. We are the bride which is at the wedding. You know, the virgins have been invited. Uh, second part, this is during the time of tribulation. The church has been taken up in a rapture, Greek word harpazo, we've been taken up into the air to meet our Lord. And on the earth, there is going on the tribulation. And now there is the passage for Israel to watch and to have the oil to be ready for the second coming. So you see, this is not related to us at all. And some people use passages like this, not understanding its time frame, where is it on a timeline. They do not understand the uh, relation to the people groups. Uh, and they, they want to put people under the spirit of bondage again to fear. Instead of making sure you are truly saved, by understanding that you, we are the lost sinners and we cannot attain sal salvation by any effort of our own at all. We are totally given to the grace of God when we come to his throne, we come to the cross where he bled for us, he made the payment, Tetelestai, John 19.30, is being paid in full, there is nothing more to be added completely uh, and we are forgiven by trusting this payment for us, where he took our place, and we are being saved by, by believing this message, by, by uh, receiving uh, God as our Savior. And then we study and we realize and understand that we have this assurance, which is beautiful. And the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And then it says, and if children, 
you see the chain of, 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 of the thought. And if children, then it means we are heirs, heirs of God, and we are joint heirs with Christ, together with Him. It speaks about this assurance that we have a heritage in heaven. And there are many, many other verses when Jesus says, I go and I prepare a place for you, and, and we are in Christ, and, and uh, many, many things. So now we are the heirs and joint heirs with Him. And then it says beautiful, and if so be that we suffer with Him, we may also be glorified together. Now this part is unpopular among all the Christians. If we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together, receiving the glory. Oh God, I would like to receive the glory, but not for suffering. I would like to receive the glory for doing big things for God. But why for suffering? And you know, uh, it's referring about uh, about the work of Christ when he suffered on the cross and he laid his he laid down his life for others and uh, he made a payment for our sins and he brought redemption and he brought uh, a peace with God to us in the same way uh, this suffering refers to a reward with glory you know uh, going through suffering many people go through suffering uh, it's not just the uh, old yellow newspapers when you read that there used to be hunger in this state and this state or this region way back and modern society took care of everything no uh, there are still people who who are in the need of a, of a food and water and other necessities but much more there are people who are in the need of the spiritual food you know we live day by day they give us day by day uh, uh, our bread daily God you know we live by every word which proceeds out of his mouth this is our food because even in a society which is rich and and uh, socially taken care well of there are people who suffer who hunger although they are filled and they are no in the need virtual need they are in a huge spiritual need you have a places with a huge depression uh, people taking their lives people are killing each other people are being hooked on a, on a substance abuse drugs or, or other other uh, other other abusive uh, behavior patterns, uh, 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 casinos and and different different uh, places where you spend your money and bidding and and other things, uh, alcohol, uh, uh, looking for acceptance, uh, people are in the big troubles. Even your neighbor, which goes and smiles at you, you don't even know what he's going through. Suffering is a part of life and nobody likes it. But with God, it's different. Verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Are you going through some suffering? Do you have some troubles? Maybe financial troubles. Maybe you lost your job and you cannot pay the rent, you cannot pay the energies, you cannot buy clothes to your children when they go to school. Uh, you have to sign them out from the school trip because you cannot pay it. And maybe they are the only ones who do not go for a school trip. It's humiliating both for the parents and the children uh, there are even many worse cases. Uh, people are getting divorced. People are getting uh, abused uh, in, in many other levels. Uh, there are different sufferings in this world and in this society. And it says here, 
that Paul is reckoning, he is uh, counting logizomai. He's making the logical conclusion that the sufferings of this present time, you know, that suffering that you are going through right now, it can't be compared to the glory which is waiting for us. It's unbelievable. That's why he writes it here. It cannot be compared with this glory. You know, First Peter 1.1, 1, 1, let's turn there. We know this verse. We quote it. It's right on, on a point. First Peter chapter 1, and basically we go to the verse 7. It says, Peter, apostle of Jesus, uh, to the strangers scattered throughout these places, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. You know, the elect ones. Those God that God foreknew, we will speak about it in the next verse, uh, in the next verses in the book of Romans. God knew, foreknew, and elected, and and through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience of sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. He says to those who are saved, who are blood washed believers, blessed be God and Father, verse three of our Lord Jesus Christ which has begotten us. Have you been born again? Have you been begotten of God? He has begotten us unto lively hope. We have this hope, living hope. It's not a dead hope made by man and it doesn't happen. This is a living hope. It's living in us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the proof. Jesus died and played uh, Pay the price, shed his blood on the cross for us, First Peter 1, 2, and he was resurrected, verse 3, to our living hope, lively hope. We have this hope because we have seen him and we know we can go there, we are going there, and it says he, he has begotten us unto this hope that we have in Christ, being born again. It says the same verses like in the book of Romans, to inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. He doesn't say it's reserved for those who will walk right and will not lose their salvation at the end of their life. Beware not to lose salvation. No. It says, to inheritance incorruptible, reserved in heaven for you. The inheritance has been reserved for you. Verse 5, for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, this is what we speak about. It's a salvation which we have received. We have been justified, Romans 5, 1. Uh, uh, and now it's ready to be revealed in the last time. God keeps us, we believe, we receive this through faith, that's the salvation which is ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this we greatly rejoice. And now it comes, that now for a season, if need be, in heaviness through manifold temptations. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. This is it. The trial of our faith is much more precious than of gold which perishes. Now, practically, what would you rather have? Would you rather have a big chunk of gold or a big trial? Ah, I know the answer. Of course, everybody would like take the chunk of gold because it would take care of many problems. Of course. But it says here, the trial of your faith, those sufferings, that's much more precious than this pile of gold which perishes. Think about it. 
Think about it. That's that's the logizomai, that's the logical conclusion. Why is he using this word logizomai? Back to Romans 8. Back to Romans 8. 18. For I reckon, I make a logical conclusion that the sufferings of this present time cannot be compared to the glory which is coming. That's a statement. That's amazing. Because naturally, everybody would take the junk of gold. You know, everybody would rather choose the gold and not the trials, not the sufferings. You know, spiritual people, spiritual Christians would rather take the gold than the sufferings. Nobody likes the sufferings. But you know, when you are in the suffering, as he says here, it cannot be compared. Why? Because the character is being tried and is being how is it written here first? First, oh, Peter 1. Just a second. It's being tried with the fire. It's being refined. You know, it's being tried with fire, refined. The character. You know, the trial will reveal a lot. And I don't mean that it will reveal a lot to others around us. They might see some things, you know, they might see some cries and be flesh out in pain and in reaction. But that's not really what the trial does, you know. The trial works deep. When deep calls unto the deep, you know, deep in the bottom of your heart, the trial works. When you realize you are crooked, when you realize you are not the one you should be, when you realize, you finally realize you need God, even in here, in this area, where you thought you need Him. You know, the trial reveals a lot about our heart. It reveals the limits we have. It, limits, it, it reveals we have no capacity. And we look for His presence. You know, when you cast yourself completely on God, when you realize you cannot do it of your own and you just cast yourself completely on God and His feet, feet and you are there in the place of worship, proskuneo, when you portray yourself on the ground before God and touching with the forehead His feet and you are there in a quiet place of worship and God's presence is there. You are before God, not before the devil. The devil has a quick solution. If you bow before me, Jesus, you will have all these kingdoms. If you bow before me, I'll give you the piece of gold. But we bow before our God and we are in his presence. And you are there and God is doing the deep work in you. He is refining you. He is refining and changing your character. And when you refine the gold, the bad part goes up and it's taken away and it's a waste, but the tried gold stays. This is what God is doing. You know, when you are in a suffering, in a deep trial, there is a God comfort. It's amazing when you when you can do things on your own and you don't need God's comfort, you don't need anybody's comfort, you are the comforter to others, you know, financially, uh, socially, uh, and on many other levels. You, you, you help people and you build them up, you encourage. But this is the place when you come to the end of yourself and you are looking for God's comfort. Now the money cannot satisfy you and comfort you. They cannot bring the solution and you are just given to God. And it's not about the uh, quantity of what you say. Many times you are just quiet, pouring your heart before God, in weeping. And God is there and he says, I understand, my son. He says, I understand, my daughter. He says,
says, I'm taking care of you right now while you are on your face before me. I am working, I'm sending my angels, I'm sending my word which comes and heals. I'm doing the work, the invisible work that nobody sees and it's written here, we will read it in the following verses. Why do you do the Logitsumai? Because sometimes you don't even feel it. You may be in, you may be in a place when you don't feel like God is doing something. But we do not walk by feelings, but by His Word. What it means? If I say, I'll be there at 5, I'll be there at 5, you can count on my words. Count on my words. I'll be there at 5. Well, it's raining, it's, it's a... Uh, there are lightning, there's a storm, but you can count on my words. I said it. And you come at that place, and at five, I'll be there. You can count on the word, not on your feelings. And this is what God wants from us when we study his scripture, his word. This is his word. That's a God's word. You know, God cannot lie. And that's why Paul says, I don't feel it. I'm in trouble. I am in sufferings, but it's so precious, you cannot even describe it. You know, when you are blind and evil is spoken about you and you are betrayed, you know what the Bible says? That the God's glory rests on you. You know, the Shekinah glory comes and God overshadows you and you are in His presence protected. There is a supernatural peace that the world cannot know. And that's why Stephen, when he was, when he was being stoned in the book of Acts, he says it. Here you go. Stephen being stoned in the Acts of 7. He has this message, he, he, he preaches to them, he preaches to the Pharisees. And he's quoting many Old Testament scriptures. And then he says here, verse 56, Acts 7, 56. Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Starts in verse 55. And he, being full of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He is, we have to understand that he is being stoned at this point. If somebody casts stone at you, what do you do? You, you protect yourself. You scream. You start to react, maybe attack. Because you are in a pain. But what he does, he glories in the suffering and he's being stoned and he sees the glory of God. This is amazing. Sometimes you go through the suffering and there you meet the glory of God that you would not meet if you would go in plenty and satisfaction. The sufferings cannot be compared. When you go through the sufferings and you meet God there, it's more precious than gold and then you understand and then you are able to say the hard words. I would choose the suffering rather than the piece of gold because I want God. I don't want to be in a plenty and, and, and uh, end up like a Laodicean church. They say, we are rich, we have everything, we are in need of nothing. And God says, you are rich and miserable, you don't know what you need. You are lost through your riches. But the suffering brings us to his presence and to this point when we need him. And we said, the emotions go crazy, you don't understand things, but you just trust and believe God. And that's what it means. The trust is developed. You know, you, you are there in this deepest work of God and you see God acting, his action. You know, sometimes the time stops. 
You just come into the presence of God. And all the rush and the going and doing and everything suddenly stops. And it's just you and God and you know that He holds time in His hand and that He is working at this present time. And this suffering at this present time cannot be compared to the glory which is coming. Oh, what a comfort we have. Trust is deepened. We learn to hear from God. And we learn to understand his heartbeat. Like Apostle John, the evangelist, he was leaning into Jesus. It's here in Job 13. Job says these beautiful words. Let's, let's look at this for the book of Psalms. Job 13, verse 15, it says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. This is an amazing statement. Though he slay me, I'll trust him. Despite the death, I will trust him. This is a question for us today. Despite what will I trust him? You know, although though he slay me, I will trust him. Though he prepares me of my earthly possessions, I will trust him. Because this is the statement of the Job. You know, he went through these attacks of the devil. He lost uh, the possessions. He lost the uh, uh, his. Uh, stock, he lost his family, he lost the houses, then the family, and he's left with and nothing, and then the devil touches his flesh. And then he makes this statement, and he says, you know, this was a big trial, losing all the possessions. Then you lose all, all everything what you have, then you lose the family because the houses fell on your family while they were celebrating you lose the closest ones and then the devil touches your flesh and Job says, you know, even if I die, I'll trust him. I know he has it in his hands. And I don't know what your situation may be. I don't know what our or somebody else's situation may be tomorrow or in five years or ten years. I just know one thing. Paul says, despite the emotions, despite what you feel, despite what, what your sight, because in this darkness you see nothing, but you hear his voice. You just learned to trust him. And we see this throughout the Bible. The book of, uh, the Gospel of Luke starts with this. Uh, the doctor, Luke, is writing his this gospel and he says here this is beautiful for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us this is how he starts I'm writing this letter basically he says uh, that I would I would give you the right order, more excellent Tophilus. You heard this and this piece and this piece and over there. I'm just writing this and I'll, I'll put it in order that you know how these things have happened. Verse 2, even as they delivered them unto us, which, from the beginning, which were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. You know, we, he says, we have this calm from the first hand, from the eyewitnesses, from the people, from the very people who were there with Jesus. And I'm writing this to you. And then it says, and it seems good to me, verse 3, also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto you in order, most excellent Theophilus. Verse 4, that you may know the certainty of those things wherein you have been instructed. This is the faith. 
You know, faith is not feeling, faith is not blind leap, like somebody says something and you just jump, and you don't even know why, this is the faith. I'm putting things in order, you have heard, this is how it truly happened. By the way, he says, my testimony is the first hand from I witnesses, which means that the source is trustworthy. Worthy. And he says, the most excellent Tophilus, that you would have perfect understanding of these things from the beginning in order that you may know the certainty. You may be certain, just learn this, that you can have firm faith, that you know what you believe. This is the faith. It's been written in order that we understand it and we can be sure of these things. That's what we said, blessed assurance, that we can be assured of those things. Not what somebody said, not what we have heard somewhere, no, but the first hand eyewitnesses and their account and it's written for you to be certain that your faith is right. And that's why we have it here. We do not follow the feelings, we follow the revelation of God uh, written and delivered to us in the scriptures, in the Bible. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for manifestation of the sons of God. This is it. You know, even the creature is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. This word for manifestation in Greek is apokalupsis, which means uh, 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 we use this for the book of Revelation. It's the same, the apokalupsis. It's a revelation. It's uncovering of something. Uh, the idea basically is if you have a statue, you've seen this happening many times. You have a statue and you put this blanket over the statue. So you can kind of like guess, is it a one person or is it somebody on a horse or maybe some bigger and somebody pulls off the cover and then it's revealed wow so this is what it speaks here that even the nature is waiting for the real truth to be revealed who we are that we are the sons that we are the children of god sons of god for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, uh, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. You know, uh, through the uh, first sin of Adam, uh, the death entered and uh, all the creation is under the curse. But now they are waiting through this hope which came through the same, through Adam and Eve and the line of Jesus and the Messiah, we got this hope. And it says here, because the creature itself, verse 14, also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into glorious liberty of the children of God. You know, everybody is dying, everybody is under the curse of sin, but Jesus died for sin at the cross. He paid for our old sin nature. And then it says, verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. They are waiting for it. You can, you can look at this nature. It's corrupted, you know. But they are waiting for this change to happen, for us to be revealed who we truly are, for the apocalypse, for the uncovering of us. You know, many people will be shocked when they will see that we are the children of God. God, and we will shine in glory very soon. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. We will shine and it will be revealed. And it says here, and not only they groan, but ourselves also. We are expecting Maranatha, the Lord, come for this uncovering. We have the first fruit of the Spirit. And we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wait redemption of our body. It says here, we are just waiting for this adoption to be witnessed, to be revealed as already established truth, which we are waiting for. Verse 24, and we are saved by hope. 
That's what we said. But hope that is seen is not hope for what the man sees. Why does he hope for? Verse 25, but if we hope for what we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. And this is what we said. We don't see many things, especially in the sufferings and in these troubles and trials and groanings and, and in this life, but it's coming, it's coming, the king is coming, it will be revealed, there will be apocalypses, it will be uncovered who we truly are, that we are the children of God and sons of God. It's written here, First John 3, 2, it's the same words, First John 3, 2, we also spoke about this. Just read it. Beloved, now you are the sons of God. Already now. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, we shall be like him. It will be glorious and it will be revealed who we are. This is the assurance. And he's just explaining. Look what is waiting for us. You know, the glory is coming. The revelation of who we are is coming. We have inheritance with him. We are his sons and daughters, the children of God. Uh, we have our father. That's why we call Abba Father. These are the words of assurance of our salvation. Already established truth, which will be revealed. Even the creation is waiting for you to see who you truly are. And in the midst of this, we go through suffering that our beautiful character is more refined and formed and that we learn to trust God Then the trust on the point of death is developed. When we, like a Job, can say, even though you slay me, I'll trust you. This is so beautiful. Oh, let's glory in this. This is, this is amazing. Wow. This is amazing. And verse 26, we will finish with this. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should even pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with the groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, the Spirit in us is praying. Sometimes we don't even know what to pray. You know, he helps our infirmities. We are not complete and perfect. We don't know many times what to do and what to pray for and how to walk, but he is doing this work, interceding for us at the throne of God because we are the children. And he searches the hearts and knows what is the mind of the Spirit. God sees it because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. God. And we don't go into the following verses because we leave this for the, for the next passage. You know, it's beautiful. Uh, words of assurance. Let's be sure of who you are. On the other hand, make sure you are blood-bought Christian. Make sure you are redeemed one. Make sure you have been born again. Make sure you are saved based on the biblical concept, not on your feelings or ideas that you have heard. Make sure your salvation is biblical according to explanation like Luke says, I have written these things from the first hand eyewitnesses which gave us the scriptures. Be sure you believe truly that you are saved. But once you are saved, be sure have this assurance that all these things will follow and will happen with us because we have been redeemed already. We have been justified. Romans 5, 1, uh, therefore being justified. We are already justified in the sight of God. We have this assurance. The book of Romans is teaching this so beautifully. How can somebody say, I do understand it? How can somebody say, uh, you can lose salvation? You know why? Because he doesn't study the Bible. People read the Bible and they make their own conclusions. But they do not study this book. Because if you would, if you would read it verse by verse and you would let God speak to you, he leads you into this, into this assurance. He's explaining what he has done on your account in heaven. 
and that's why we study words like justification, uh, a propitiation, expiation, which means to appease God, to deal uh, with, with, the, with the result of a sin uh, on the part of a man. Uh, we have received God's just, justification and we have received the, the robe of righteousness, etc., etc. Beautiful book, beautiful truth. God bless you. Uh, see you again. In Jesus' name, amen.